um, have been producing over the last uh, 20 years, I think, uh, represent what we all should uh, aspire to, uh, uh, especially in this next generation here at SIARC. Um, I'll see if I can read my, my handwriting here, which I just jotted down. Um, Co-op Himmelblau, as Wolf calls it, um, I call it Coop Himmelblau. Uh, it's my prerogative in Los Angeles. They started in 1968. They had a third partner, currently there's two. Um, the work has always been a medium for them to pursue ideas and then interrogate the ideas as soon as they're captured. An approach it has ranged from theoretical propositions to very articulate objects that, in my experience of them in Vienna, reside somewhere in the erogenous zone. Um, fixtures, gallery installations, urban performances, building design, and city planning is the body of their work. Currently, they've won uh, two major competitions, one for uh, a city planning as uh, a new town outside Paris, which I suppose he'll show tonight, and um, a rehabilitation of a building, an old theater in Vienna, which is quite a large project. Uh, I think they could be considered architectural activists. I believe the expression of their ideas through the work has the intention of being provocative in order to challenge anyone that's confronted by it. They have also pursued a more traditional pr approach to teaching, as Wolf is doing this year, the uh, fall and the spring semesters at SciArc. They've developed a very personal style that's, uh, I think, quite uh, innovative, and they've been very consistent to their original objectives um, as uh, in a partial statement uh, that they've uh, written. We are tired of the historical masks because we want architecture to exclude everything that is dis disquieting. We want architecture to make, we want architecture that bleeds, that exhausts, that whirls, and, and even breaks. Uh, I believe that this is a, a reflection of the contemporary world that we live in. And uh, none other, I think, uh, to represent that better than uh, Wolf Pricks. Thank you very much. It's still very hot in here. Huh? And I'm s still very exhausted because I'm on European time. It means I'm here. My body is in Europe. And my brain is in between, so <laughs> maybe it will take, it will be a very long lecture, <laughs> but we will have fun. Two concerns have been in the forefront of our work in the last couple of years. The first concern is the conception, or better, the moment of conception. The other concern, we call it open architecture. Open architecture, what does it mean? That the building doesn't have a roof, no doors, no windows. Does it mean that the building isn't finished? No. That's not what it means. Open architecture means open mind, open eyes, open ears and open heart, consciousness. That's the attitude of, of open, architecture, open architecture. The elements of this open architecture could be the psychic ground plan, facades as third skins, light is a sculpture, Forms are mutating and transitions and expansions. All these elements do show up in our projects, sometimes more, sometimes less. The German word for conception is Entwurf. And the German language is very precise in this case. 
and dwarf. The first syllable and refers to an unconscious, subconscious human procedure. The second syllable, wurf, comes from the word meaning to throw or to give birth. Both together, and dwarf is a very complex human way of thinking. One might not be aware at the first glance, but there is a lot of discussion about absolute architecture and absolute forms. It doesn't matter which architect, which society built the building, they say. They say if the form is absolute, then it's good architecture. Our statement is that the architect, his hand or his head, invents the building. He is therefore personally responsible for it. And we assume that the more frustrated, more tortured, or disturbed, or free the architect is, the more frustrated, conservative, tortured, or free is the architecture which he invents. So the following sentence can be inter interpreted. Is this instant free from pressure, the instant of conception, free from pressure, cliche and formalism, then architecture becomes free. Then architecture is now. Can I have the first image, please? In the last couple of years, without knowing where it could lead, we have begun to condense the moment of actual conception, to shorten it. By that I mean we talk about the project for a long time, but without considering the architectural tangible consequences, and then suddenly there is a drawing on the paper, on the table, and almost at the same time there's a model that works in this way, Almost immediately, we are a team, we are two. Almost immediately, after one of us begins to draw, he begins to describe what he is doing, what he is drawing. And in this way, the project becomes reality for the other as well. And in this way, we share the experience of every creation. We cannot prove it, but we believe the more intensely the creator experiences his conception, the more the inhabitants will be able to experience the building. And in this moment, when architecture is lived, when one feels the architecture, this is, this is the moment. Then all the circumstantial pressure crumble, causality is overturned in this moment. In this instant, architecture is now. Can I have the next one? Can you put out this light? Can you switch out this, uh, this spotlights, please? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, slide uh, shows the open house. It's a project from 83, and the client wasn't sure about what he wanted. <laughs> so we, that's a chance, it's a real chance. So we spent long hours in conversation with the client, but uh, the, the, this discussion didn't uh, give us an idea about what sort of rooms he needed. But it did allow us to determine his emotional needs. And one day, the house was there. Not the building itself, but the feeling. The form and the details weren't important in this moment. What was important was the emanation of light and shadow, dark and light, height and width of light and walls, view and air. We could sense all that, and in order to not be led astray, not even by the drawing graphic, we drew the sketch with our next eyes closed. 
So the, the finger touching the paper and the hand holding the pencil um, was a seismograph of the feeling which would awaken by the constructed space. So that's a psych psychic ground plan. And the creation of the building was experienced so strongly that it was easy on, this, on the basis of this explosive drawing to build a model immediately. Next. And this is the next step. Uh, and here it is where teamwork is very important. Construction material is developed, but always determined by the original feeling. The working model is measured. This is uh, the size of this model is about the size of a matchbox. Uh, the working model is measured and we begin to work in a larger scale next down to the smallest detail. Next, ground plan and cross section define this house. The tilted box which rests on stilts slopes to the ground. And the only way to enter the house is via stairs which led to the first floor of the box. From this level, one can take stairs through the arch to the lower level. Next. The house is approximately 300 square meters. I don't, how many square feet? 3,000, three yes, 300 square meters. And it isn't divided in, into rooms. The client will be able to divide the area into rooms once the skin is finished. But he says he wants to live in it a while before he does this. Maybe he will do it immediately, maybe he will never do it. That's also an aspect of open architecture. Next. The sense of these seemingly arbitrary forms become clear as one uh, begins to draw the uh, working plans. For instance, this tilted box becomes a double shell construction which is not only excellent for a passive energy system, but it also makes it possible to change the installation, installation system at any time. Next, the power of the drawing is also translated into the construction. The box is mounted on two points and held in place by tension lines. And these tension lines allow us to have two layers of glass. Next, we are planning uh, to cover uh, this glass uh, with blinds in order to control the sunlight. Fixed blinds and movable blinds. Next. And this slide demonstrates that we don't want to confuse openness with transparency. And it also shows that our facades, for example, this corrugated aluminum part, are no longer facades but actually skins. So the short description of this project could be the feeling of the inside stretches the skin of the outside. More details about this project uh, next year, I hope next year, the same place. <laughs> uh, we trained ourselves to realize such project without compromising this explosive creative moment. And we did um, installation for exhibition in this uncompromising, uh, uncompromising way. Uh, the process is much more important for us than, a, uh, than the goal. But elements of these objects do show up occasionally in later projects and buildings. Next. For example, this is an object architecture is now, which was built in Stuttgart in Germany, 82. And it's the uncompromising realization of a conception next, which occurred in the early evening of the 5th of March of the same year. OK, yeah, back. It's the drawing. We did the drawing next and the model. And then we built it. The space is about 400 square meter, the elements. It's, a, it's, it's like a one family house. The elements are made of steel, tin, concrete, and wire netting. 
and the text reads, our architecture is not domesticated. It moves around in urban areas like a panther in a jungle. Next, the burst beam is the backbone and the head of the panther. He rises and sinks. Next, the curved guardrail uh, arch through the space and continue to the outside. Next, and it come to an end in a folded wing. And this is the extension of the space to the outside. Next, second object. We call it skin of the city. It was done for Berlin. And it was directly translated from the drawing without, we proved it, whether we can do it without the model. And um, this wire fence should be a horizontal a network of nerves and tin and glasses and tar paper and glasses stretched over the transversal beams creating a three-dimensional space. Urban materials, perhaps aggressive, perhaps unpleasant, but real. Next. And this deformed and bent and tortured tin wall. Next. You remember the open house. Huh? This is an object. Next. We did for the Museum of Architecture in Frankfurt. It's a permanent installation. Next. And if you think, you could see a detail of the open house. Yeah, you are right. Now you want to say to me, it's fine to draw sketches with eyes closed. Uh, but how do you do it when you are working in a, in a larger scale? Let's not start too large. But for example, for an example, uh, what happens when you want to plan an apartment building with 50 flats? Next. This happens, yeah. <laughs> Okay, if you, if you only have architecture in your head, or magazines in your head, that's all that will come out. For example, if you only think about Vitruv, Palladio, or Schinkel, then you will only design like Vitruv, Palladio, and Schinkel. And that's the case today anyway. <laughs> and the architects, especially in Germany. The architects are not only designing like Schinkel, they even look like him. <laughs> this project uh, does not look like Schinkel. And it doesn't pretend any historical self-importance. It's rather a statement of the four basic, basic rights of a city dweller, the right to a large living area, the right to an inexpensive living area, and the right to design that living area by yourself, and finally, the right to a timely architecture. So, this project is free of false meaning. It is a three-dimensional solution of a building problem as far as any solution exists. And the conscious forms of the outer shape are the visible possibilities and their variations. And the inner space is differentiated, but not determined. And, is, and the inner space is the result of a complex spatial interlacing solutions. Next, the problem was to fill a space between uh, two buildings on a street in the second district in Vienna. 50 flats should fit into this area. Maybe it's a good time to explain our basic principles. Uh, for it's in this way that we, de we will decide whether or not to build this project. Himmelblau demand also rights, two rights. The right to take our time <laughs> and the right to be disobedient. <laughs> the German psychologist Eric Fromm said, I quote, the history of mankind began with an act of disobedience, and it is not unlikely that it will end with an act of obedience. 
I would like to instill the sense of these words into the attitude of all architects. Okay, next. Uh, as you can see, this project breaks many building codes. <laughs> and as it evident, the uh, permitted building heights and the street line are not followed. Uh, we do not agree that we should have to doggedly follow building codes which were perhaps progressive at the beginning in the 19th century in Vienna without asking why. Naturally, no one wants a building to fall apart. But if we have to follow rules, there has to be some purpose to them. They have to be reasonable. And they also have to allow for exceptions. So trying to get around with the officials is one of uh, uh, our larger parts of our job in Vienna. <laughs> there are many stories about that. The building consists of two pieces set at angles to each other, tilted over with two slices of flame meat. Within this form, we have allowed for 50 half-finished apartments. The floor plans vary somewhat, but they are all two stories that is approximately six meters high and can be converted, enlarged into at least 300 square meters. Why does it look like it does? No one knows. There is no need to explain everything in architecture, to have always an explanation before you start to design. The explanation almost always sounds like an apology. It looks like this because, well, you know, yeah, because of the past, because of my favorite Vitruv, Palladio, etc., etc. No, it looks like this because that's how we want it. We want it and we enjoy it. A word next. Just a word about the way in which we present these layouts and sectional drawings. We call them X-ray drawings. We ask ourselves, what is the best way to present these very complex spatial relationships? And so we began to draw views and sectional drawings in one plan. And in this way, you can almost see the building with X-ray vision. And this technique allows us to prove, it's very hard to read for you, but it allows us to prove the relationships which, also you won't be able to see them when it's finished, the, the building is finished. You will be able to feel them. Because that's the way how it is in open architecture. Okay, left. The ground plan, X-ray ground plan. Next, from zero to 10 meters. Next, this is about 15 to 20 meters. How else could you, could you draw or a, a working plan from a ascending building complex? Next, it is higher, it's from, I don't know. Next. <laughs> Next, we're coming on the top. Uh, next, this is the, another cross section and um, uh, it shows this nervous system of ramps and the tilt of the main buildings. And next, and this isometric uh, X-ray drawing of the building shows the ramp which extends diagonally through the space and also a very schematic presentation of an apartment. Next, this is the model of one of these apart uh, apartments and you can see the two floors, the hanging support and the skylight. The skylight is there because the two pieces they don't fit together right now. So, um, the, the, 
the apartment inside the building are much more, are not apartments or flats, it's much more like a landscape. And everybody uh, who wants to live in this building can choose his favorite landscape and should be able to alter it. Uh, on the right side, this is a structural, a structural model of the construction and it's a, also a study of the different parts of the facade. And as you know, next, when we say facade, um, facade we mean shaped skin. And, do, and therefore, we show again the slide of the, skin, of the project Skin of the City. And as it turns out, everything we do has a purpose. <laughs> Nothing for nothing. Um, I think the building expenses are very, very important for such project. There are many solutions for that. One, we, we have just one very simple. We increase every meter by five centimeters. That means five percent. By expanding every meter, uh, by five centimeter, the volume increases by 15 percent. We have an annual inflation rate in Austria of five percent. So the 15 percent cost increase can be made up by building the project three years earlier. Depends when we start. <laughs> I hope it will come soon. It's a hard fight uh, because um, this uh, this building is uh, is cheaper than the normal social uh, building in Vienna, and that's we suppose that's the reason that we couldn't build it. We are not allowed to build it because if you can prove that you are able to build cheaper than the normal uh, building things. Yeah, that's a shame for the community. Eh? That's the reason. But maybe uh, we can make it more ex expensive eh? <laughs> by building it only two years earlier. OK, the, the height of this apartment complex measured from the sidewalk exactly, uh, from the sidewalk to the wing, exactly 42 meters. A building nine times this height could look like this. Next. You see the model of a skyscraper for Hamburg, <coughs> or to be more precise, the first section of a skyscraper complex and just one part of the project we have developed for the Hamburger Bau Forum in fall 85, I think. Next, uh, here you can see the first sketch for the whole planning area. The planning area is on the bank of the River Elbe in the, at the Hamburger, Hamburger Docks. <laughs> um, and we designed Next, not only a variation of houses, swimming houses, to, uh, to densify the, the, this, uh, this bank um, of the river, but also, and that is, that is, was very important for us, also a structure, we call it loft beam, uh, which reaches not only into the water, but also determines the course of the suggested city development. So we call it, we try to, every, every time we make city planning projects, we try to find the sleeping forces of a city. It's, and try to wake the forces up and construct them and build them. It's like to wake up a, chi a sleeping child. Next. This is the model of the whole planning area. And the, on the right, you can see the, the, the planning area. And on the left, these towers 
are the media, we call it media task, uh, and three part, uh, three part towers of uh, which, uh, which are built directly in the docks in the water. Next, this is a closer view to this uh, loft beam and the suspended platform and the swimming uh, houses. Next. This is a section through the skyscraper, X-ray section. Next, there are three interwoven next building complexes, uh, about uh, 375 meters high. And these building complexes are office towers for the print media uh, that make the city of Hamburg so important for Europe. And the offices are not only one dimensional connected, but vertically connected, diagonally and three dimensionally to a media high school and hotels and shopping areas and so forth. Next, that's the ground plan. And next, that's the first sketch of these media towers. The bigger the project, the bigger the models. This model is exactly three meter high and has the scale one to 125. So cities were always in our mind. And next, the first project we ever did was a city, a more utopian one, and we called it uh, a city must beat like a heart and fly like a breath. And since then, since 68, every two years we did an urban design project, just for fun, and just to prove that we do not lose the feeling for, for a larger scale, um, because we are building a lot, but very small projects. So we try to enlarge our scale feeling again and again. And we were very happy that we were invited to this international city planning competition and we are even more happy that we could win it. Uh, on the left you see the, the brief of the competition, on the right the solution. Um, in between is half a year very bloody work uh, because we spent a lot of time to develop our ideas. Could we sharpen this uh, on the right side? A little bit sharp. We spent a lot of time to develop these things. The brief was to develop a master plan for Melancena. Because it's the, it's the finished process. 
at least we develop all our jobs as they have to solve the uh, Next. No, it's okay. This was actually the, the competition plan. And you can see the urban center, which, is, uh, we had a, which had a lot of facilities and a lot of infrastructure, from school to university, shopping center, and so forth. Yeah, like, you know that. Um, at next, first we began to sketch all our ideas of the wide range of a city life. Because our city shouldn't become a monofunctional sleeping system of buildings, but our city should be an anticipation of an expanding urban vitality. For us, a city is a city if this city contains all the dis dis discrepancy. Is that right? Uh, dis discrepancy of life. So we sketch structures uh, which show all variation of next hot and cold and low and high, of tensed and untensed, of quietness and loudness, small and tall, and so on. Next. Uh, this, is, um, this is a sketch we try to enlarge. Because I think th that's one of our, uh, of our ways how, how we work. We do a sketch, sometimes we smaller the sketch on the, uh, on the syrup machine. Sometimes we enlarge it to find new structures maybe uh, which could very be very helpful for us to design buildings, for example. Next. And this is uh, one of the most important thing um, in, in, in this competition, because we uh, thought we demanded a three-dimensional zoning. Uh, to answer the increasing uh, density for social and public space, uh, we said that every developer which built higher than 15 meters should uh, uh, put a, a, a special zoning in between so that uh, it uh, that could densify the, the, the oh I lost it could somebody help me in German? It's in German very, very hard to explain. Okay. Uh, if you have a room space, then try to densify the room space. Because of ordering uh, around, so the, the, people, uh, the people try to build higher. Uh, that's, uh, that's the reason for speculators to build high. Because it's very, very uh, fancy. Uh, we said you should try to keep them low the buildings uh, because we need uh, densifying the, uh, the first stage we, we, we need densifying the, the, the area and if you if you do it you have to expand space for the city so if you build higher than 15 meters, you have to do 5 meters zoning. And if this, uh, you can see the blue space, put the city back again. Next. That's the first sketch, uh, which deals uh, with the reality. And uh, we copied it into the site plan. Uh, we we smaller uh, we, we we smaller the uh, the scale and copied into the site plan, and now we began to uh, next to design the f the future steps next. The f um, on the right on the right slide you can see uh, these uh, stages in the primary planning phase, which will take uh, till ninety five. The first stage, 
on the on the left uh, on the left slide. The first stage is the radiating boulevards. We um, within the industrial triangle, the core of the city development is defined, and that's the point where the boulevards start to radiate. And the second stage we call Little LA, because <laughs> webs of cottages are stretching in between these two boulevards, we call it force lines. And then the next, the third, and that's the secondary planning phase. It will take till uh, 15 years, 1998. The third is the, uh, we call violating the infrastructure because unexpected new and violent urban structures intersect and differentiate the existing web of provincial houses and these are uh, complexes of loft beams. And the fourth is intensifying this infrastructure because unforeseeable dynamic elements are fed in this stage into the urban system and amplifying uh, the city life. This secondary planning phase we call uh, uh, the battle of the forces. And the fifth is, the, is the, the fifth would be the demand of the three-dimensional zoning and the sixth uh, stage um, is the development of height the, ent the entire city will develop. Complexity becomes even more complex in the, at this stage, and high becomes e height becomes even higher abruptly. And then the city is open, so we call it open city. Uh, next, this is the concept for landscape and leisure, because uh, the first stage should uh, they ask us to design a landscaping project. And we did, um, we did a green belt, a green belt here, we excavate the lake, and this is the excavation, we build a hill, which uh, is the demanded wind protection, and we, uh, we handle the plant, highway which crosses exactly the green meadow and will destroy all the land. So we, uh, uh, we, we ask them to handle the, the whole uh, street system and with the excavation to build the, uh, the hill. Another very important thing is that we, we believe that it's very important for the future of the city to connect nature with uh, artificial buildings, and so we uh, stand through a canal which reaches into the uh, city system. The stage of uh, the, the first, second, and third stage you can see on the right side next. This is the city that has the traffic control plan, which is very complicated, but you can see uh, on this slide. The Tango uh, Highway, uh, which is very important, and I think we can convince them to do that, to handle the highway uh, so that the green meadow could be a green meadow and could be ready for the building of the city. Right? That's a very important thing about the uh, water drainage system, uh, purification system, yes. <laughs> several steps. That's the master plan and the site plan. Here you can see the industrial zone, the green belt with the lakes, the uh, hill, and the tunnel, uh, the tunnel highway, and this one, two, three, four uh, cities which are now uh, try, which now try to increase this green meadow. Therefore, there, there was the, the, uh, the competition. Next. This uh, is uh, the first, the second, yes. the third, 
stage. Uh, okay. For this project, we, we need about 20 years. So we are at the edge now, and we didn't sign the contract yet, but I think we will do it. But we will never do the city by, by, by alone. So we try to, to make international competition because you know if one architect with one city, uh, there, are, there are many examples around that. Next. How can you build such uh, big things uh, from a sketch? We tried it. That, that's a sketch for, that's a sketch, a designing sketch, and that's the isometric drawing from the real life project. And you can see that all lines we sketch um, are built. That's a project. It's a studio for an art collector in Vienna. I don't need that. I, I have to do a shortcut. Huh? The client want, uh, wanted a studio in which he, he's a graphic artist, could work and live along with the pictures of his friends, paintings of his friend. He has very important paintings from Austrian painters. Other requirements were not expressed. So, next, we had a room of uh, about 50 square meters, five meter high, and three doors. And the small size of the space did not discourage us. The three portals were not in our way, and the height of the room was very agreeable for us because we saw walls next and doors and thought of movable stairs, flying platforms, of bridges and galleries. Uh, and we thought about uh, paintings hanging in three rows and we thought about suspended roofs that turned into frozen wings and we thought of sliding glass. So the drawings, uh, the drawing, the first drawing you saw was finished in November 84 and in July 85 uh, the project was built. Next. Next. Uh, one entrance leading over a folding stairs to the gallery that is crossing to the room along the upper row of the, of the paintings. And next, the platform is an additional work area. And the client alone had the choice of furnishing and the arrangement. Next. Now look at the grass plant. How do you think uh, the client Yeah. 
not allowed to do uh, unprotected steel constructions in Vienna without uh, for storage room. Uh, so we decided to tell the official that the upper floor is a storage, storage room uh, and it, it has its own entrance. So we can do <laughs> That's a movement, that, that's a movement stair because sometimes the guy wants a, a larger space uh, down on the third floor. And so we designed uh, a movement stair so we so can use more space. So this is the situation down, stair down. Next. Next. We know why the building code to be added because one code said you are not allowed to reach over the building line from zero to three meter and ten. Next. <laughs> <laughs> very hard to calculate. Uh, so we decided to, to, to make three parts, determine three parts, uh, the stair, the platform, the bridge, calculate them and knock them together on this column. And there, the column is uh, only six uh, centimeters uh, thin, but it supports more than six tons. Because the advantage of the anti-thermal set system is that all parts are supported. So if you step on the staircase, all parts of the system are su uh, supports you. Uh, so therefore, we can use very, very thin material and very, very suspended material. It's like it's an uh, anti thermal static system, an airplane. For example, it's an undetermined static system. Next, next, next. Uh, just some details uh, to show how we sculpture life. Next, 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 next. As you can see, nothing fits together. Next. Next. That's in the in this, this on the second level. The window is by the window of the room. Next. Next. That's the sliding door. He has to open every time when the telephone rings in the second floor. Next. The wing sculpture is the th uh, of the th in the third portal is a self-supporting aluminum outer wall. I suppose it's the thinnest outer wall in Vienna. It's only about two centimeters thick. Next, the construction bending inwards and uh, to the side, it's, it, the construction is glazed and differentiates the natural light. And with the help of the this radiator, the sculpture becomes a convection area and supports this because it supports the circulation of air in this five meter high studio. And at the same time, the wing sculpture defines the interior and exterior of the space and serves as control for light and air. Next. Next. Uh, th this building, this small building, was, uh, has been so intensively considered and built that it could be easily ten, ten times 
its own size without losing anything. And we regard it therefore as a model for the next project. We are now const in con construction. And it's located in, in the Vienna inner city. Next. And it's an attic conversion. Uh, one thing to the building code if in the inner city, you are not allowed, if you, if, if you rebuild the uh, attic, you are not allowed um, to change the roof pitch at any case. So you can see we um, uh, follow this rule to the letter. We have the permission to do that now, and we are under construction. It will be finished, I hope, in the spring next year. Next. The task is to organize an area of, uh, for office units, and the next, the existing roof is changed into vaulted and slanted parts, um, supported next by construction, uh, tents and taut, and the construction is the groin and the backbone of this architecture. Next. As you can see, we built for every construction stage a new model because we develop uh, very much details on the model. Next. Uh, that's wrong. What's that? You have to change the... <laughs> you have to change the carousel. <laughs> on the left. And the sculptured forms of the space um, of this uh, office will be never visible as a complete unit. You can only sense it through the transitions. So it's a form mutation. Mutation of the form moving uh, toward the, the dissolving of the form next. and the left. So the sculptured uh, forms and form mutations are both aspects of open architecture. Oh, that's, uh, that's, yeah, you have to go through. Yeah, that's the construction model. That's the form mutation. The sculptured form and form mutations are both aspects of open architecture because a form, next, which mutates can be powerful or sensitive, but it all can always be experienced. And to show uh, how we develop these forms, i show you next. Our first project, next on the right. Next. This was our first project, done 10 years ago. The Reisberg, very simple lines, next. 10 years later, no, no, five years later, it looks like this. It's the Red Angel. The task was to build a wine bar, and this project deals a lot with uh, protection. Not uh, physical protection, but psychic protection. Because we have to do a wine bar, a combination of a wine bar and a, a stage for a singer. And the first th thought of us, uh, my God, uh, we are very, uh, we have to protect this poor singer who performs um, for a drunken bunch of <laughs> people. So, um, next. Next. So, the sketch of an angel appears um, like from themselves. And next, this angel is a sculpture in space and at the same time defines the space. It begins, begins above the stage and has also a body, chest, back, backbone, and wings. Um, the body is um, out of glass blocks because who can really say like an angel's body look like? And um, the body leaned diagonal over the stage and can also be seen from the outside. This, um, here you can see the sound line, which comes from the middle of the stage, going out, arches through the street, and thrilling inside the restaurant again. Next. 
that's the wing cuts through the existing walls and they have the country in there, yes. Uh, that's the end of the little wing. You would not see that if you are in Vienna because it's the uh, emergency exit to the courtyard uh, of the restaurant. Next. Uh, that's the that's the grass end of the existing restaurant that was uh, in situation before we started. As you can see, we removed, we had to remove one, two, three uh, uh, heavy supporting walls. It's a very old building, and we had the problem of money, like every architect, and time. And we could convince the, the client that it's much uh, more cheaper and faster to rent the, the bar to the bar the restaurant and do the supporting construction there. <laughs> <laughs> Next. That's um, uh, just a look uh, to our recent project. Uh, this should be again a bar. Germany, Düsseldorf, at the restaurant in Vienna. This series we did, uh, we designed within a week. Next. That's an office space, and we built it already, and that's, that's that. <laughs> Next. <laughs> that's a big, 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 um, this was the last thing we decided, but we, we read it first. And as you can see, the Japanese project is an uh, art <coughs> craft shop in Tokyo. Next. And it's really an old lecture because Japanese haven't a word for diagonal. <laughs> <laughs> And it was heavy duty to do that within three weeks. <laughs> we did it. The old lecture. You know what? My Japanese bathroom has towels around their heads. Is it not? Because you can sleep like that. <laughs> Other side. Next. <laughs> Every position. They had the knob here. <laughs> Perhaps you're crazy. <laughs> really, I hope. Oh, the lecture. Come on. <laughs> but uh, we, we could convince them that, uh, uh, that they could do that. Okay, next. That's the, 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 the mouse switchy. <laughs> mouse switchy. <laughs> next. And that's. That was the, the most difficult part because this part uh, reaches into the street outside to the Tokyo heaven. And I could tell you stories about uh, trying clamps. Our craftsmen use clamps every day. And if we have to, uh, if he has to, to fix the structure, he first uh, need, uh, use clamps to fix the structure and then uh, what's the question? Uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Well, 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 well. Okay. It came with one part, it came with one part, melt to the other. So, uh, but if they reach the window, it doesn't fit about a meter. So we can it again. <laughs> we show them how to use clamps. <laughs> they have only two. <laughs> we, we show them. You fix it first and then. Okay, next day they come with 400 clamps. Right. <laughs> 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 this time it was one year ago. I think it was September. It was very hot and raining every day. And you know what they did with the clamps? They made a wonderful wooden construction to protect them from the rain. Instead of nailing, 
a youth plan. <laughs> <laughs> we now do another project for Tokyo, but we refuse to go there, so we fax all the plans, and we'll see <laughs> how it works. Okay, next. Next, please. Uh, next on the left. Next. On the left, please. The other one. So put it back. Build it for mutation. This is a shop in, in Vienna. It's not a shop. It's a part of the shop. It's a massage leading from a very important street uh, to, the, to the main shop. It's a very important shop. Do you understand me? <laughs> There's a crack on, on the supporting beam. Next. On the, uh, could, could have back, 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 back. I want to see it again. That's the portal. No. OK, for, okay, that's the portal. And uh, here you can see the supporting beam, which is cracked. Next. Because of meeting the two. Uh, uh, force lines. Next. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Next. And on the left side. This is the organization is ISO holding and this uh, it, it's again a secret. Um, how do we do uh, working plans? It's easy. We just copy the model. <laughs> First, we build the model, then we copy the model and blew it the, the, the copy to the right scale. Next. As you can see, it works. It's, a, it's, a office, it's, a, it's an office unit. And I'm, I'll take now a shortcut. Next. <laughs> Here, you can see the organization. We, uh, we removed all uh, the non-supporting walls and did a completely new open office space. And on, in the entrance, in the lobby, we designed um, a ceiling, uh, emerging lines which going through the space and enlarge it visually. Next. Uh, some th yeah, that, that's the ceiling, that's the entrance. Next. I'm surprised what I can see. Uh, this, uh, l it was very difficult <laughs> to move these uh, large uh, sliding, uh, slide, glass sliding doors to the office because, because it's in the fourth floor in a very old building with very narrow uh, staircases. So um, that's a circumstantial pressure. <laughs> so all the dimensions coming from this narrow staircase. <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's uh, a red letter wall and uh, the triangle here, you can see where the, where, where the line goes through, um, is painted in RAL 5050, that means sky blue. It's like a, a signing um, a project. And one uh, Viennese critic, critic saw this uh, heaven blue, sky blue uh, beam in the Wallis passage uh, showed before and he wrote that we are very clever because we, we are dealing with the uh, light blue of the of the porcelain <laughs> of the of the objects of the pottery no? yeah okay next 
some details, some more details. <laughs> okay, next. That's the entrance. It's a very old, uh, uh, heavily protected landmark because it's, it's built from a very, very important uh, Viennese Baroque architect. Next. Shortcut right side. That's the beginning of the X-ray drawings. It's a model for a school. That's an that's a own lecture. Left, that's the Ronacher, the theater. Um, there was an comp invited competition in Vienna. It's a very old building, non-functional old theater. And the task was to uh, reorganize this uh, landmark to, uh, for a theater for the next century, next. Um, our suggestion was, if you have a, a old theater, if you, uh, we call it Guckkastenbühne, proscenium theater, only one part of six parts of the volume can be used by the public. So we tried to design a space theater, more or less a space theater, a house which have, uh, which have stages from the cellar to the top. Next. And as you can see on the right slide, the black thing is the protected. No, the whole thing is a heavily protected landmark. We uh, convinced the client that it's more useful for a theater to have space, and so we cut it uh, in two parts. The left side is the old one. Uh, renovated, will be renovated very, very exactly. And the right side, the white one, is uh, and the, the rooftop, and uh, the rooftop is, is the new one. Next. Uh, we have to build a model to show that our rooftop will not destroy the uh, rooftop uh, landscape of the inner city. Uh, we convinced the officials in, the, in this case, next. Helmut called me that uh, they give the okay, but they didn't see this. <laughs> next. <laughs> or this. The next, uh, um, next very heavy point we have to solve is the facade, because they want to discuss every detail and in this case, that's the competition model. We, we didn't show the uh, more details than necessary because everybody has, um, of these officials, everybody has his own uh, imagination of uh, um, putting an old uh, facade to a new one, uh, together to, to, to a new one. And the most progressive one says, come on, reconstruct, if you have to pull down because of building things, if you have to pull down the old <laughs> facade, please uh, rebuild it exactly like it is. Um, we will never do that. Next. <laughs> As you can see. <laughs> Next. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What's on the right side? The right side. Yeah. Some some model views. Uh, yeah, Co Pimmelblau uh, existed since '68, and uh, was founded by two peoples, my friend and partner Helmut Zwiczynski and myself. Uh, it was a very, very, 68 was a very good time. Rough sketches and cities next, which on the left. Okay, back. Yeah, cities. Uh, I mentioned before, which beat like a heart and fly uh, like your press. Next, 
pneumatic spaces and pulsating and exploding happenings were at the time our main project. Uh, next. Uh, 77, after building the rice bar, no, back, back, the right, back. Okay, back. So, uh, 1977, after building the rice bar, the trend of the so-called postmodern architecture became unbearable for us. <laughs> at, the, at, that, at that time, it was fashionable to draw columns, temples, and tympanons. In sharp contrast, in our studio, we were drawing squares as temporary, temporary planning mistakes. Next. We, we drew architectural structures which stuck like bones in the flesh of the city. Next. We designed houses without gables, but out of raw concrete. And instead of columns, there was a community room which went through to the building. And we said, the safe and sound world of architecture does not exist, and it will never exist again. Architecture gains meaning in proportion to its desolation. This desolation comes from an act of using, and it gains strength from the surrounding desolation. And this architecture brings us the message, everything you like is bad, everything that works is bad, Whatever has to be accepted is good. Thank you very much. Um, he's, he's willing to take a few questions, if you'd like to ask. <laughs> That's his first answer, I guess. In America, you stay here when they ask questions, yeah. 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 I was looking for the ball. It's a tradition. A very old one. Yes. Okay, now you're, it's a tradition to also ask if you have questions. I'm here, thank you very much. No questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There'll be a reception in the graduate annex. You know this German word, fantastisch? Yeah. Very good. Uh, you know, I was thinking maybe Saturday's a better day for the tour because as if you're showing slides, I thought we should do other stuff besides downtown. Yeah, yeah. And maybe if you have a day, I could do a day because my wife and kid are going out of town.
Uh, that's that's probably the, a good question at this point. Um, as far as the, as far as the the question is, what is how do I decide on the the nature of the sounds, and I think probably also the nature of the materials, whether that's an intellectual process or something that uh, is uh, uh, based in some other uh, belief system, uh, such as a spiritual or or uh, whatever mystical meanings. And it's it's all of those. It's not necessarily I don't necessarily make distinctions in that way. A lot of it is intuitive, but it's intuitive. Intuitively derived at through an intellectual guidance, um, I, the actual selection of the sounds again is trying to set up systems allowing the environment to collaborate within the final structure of it. The the direction that, I'll, that I do plan to go is very much to continue some of the same process of uh, uh, refining the technologies. I'm getting more and more involved with uh, computer technology to do this, and I've just finished. Uh, integrating a system which is backpackable, a uh, uh, fairly large micro computer based uh, sampling system where what will consist of just being able to work no with nothing but digitized uh, segments of the environment itself. So this is part of this project called Sonic Mirror where the sounds are simply extractions up to maybe 10 seconds of, of the sounds of the environment and then being able to write computer programs which organize these according to certain algorithms which are also being controlled by the environment. Did that help? <laughs> or did that hurt? Uh, besides the thing of, of just trying to, in the design sense, trying to be open to the systems and trying to set up these self-organizing systems, the, uh, there's also direct ways of doing that with technology electronically so that some of the pieces involve what are called pitch to voltage converters where the sounds of the environment through a microphone is being picked up which consists of an AC signal, an audio signal, which is then being converted to fluctuations in some other electronic standard which then can be converted to a MIDI standard so the computer can understand it or whatever and or controlled using that as a control voltage to push an oscillator so that fluctuations of the environment correspond to fluctuations within an electronic system. So the easiest way of maybe understanding is that what I've, stat what I've specified as the composition or as the music is a, a particular technological configuration which allows for perturbation from the environment itself. Anybody, anybody else out there? I can't see much, so I apologize. It, you're asking it, it uh -huh. Right. Oh, absolutely. It, it's it's just the the evil. The, the problem is not necessarily with machines. Machines, the notion of the machine and technology, and we, technology I, I don't necessarily make a differentiation between uh, an electronic computer or a, uh, some other more simple organic tool. I mean, these, these are simply tools, and the tools can be used in a number of ways, some of which are destructive. I'm not saying that technology is neutral. I don't think technology is neutral at all, but we... Uh, can at least participate in the decisions about how that is used. And tools have been used in a number of ways, some of which are extremely life-affirming in various cultures. And even one of the, of course, the distinctions traditionally between human beings and other animals was that we were supposedly the tool user and other animals weren't, which of course is just simply not true. That's been thrown out a long time ago. There's a lot of other animals which use tools. For instance, if the octopus has been shown that octopi uh, will steal the uh, stinging tentacles from uh, jellyfish and use them as a tool to gather food. They will break them off and then hold them with their tentacles and use them to sting shrimp. <laughs> and they even use them 
two, there's been one case observed where one octopus was defending itself against a moray eel attack by using these uh, jellyfish stingers. So tools are something, tools are a part of nature. That's certainly the intention. Uh, I, 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 there are ways of doing that in terms of direct animal communication research and all of that, but that's something I've decided to, to not do directly. And like I said, said earlier. Oh, some, sure, I'm very interested in all that. It's real important work. Is there another hand? Oh, yeah. No, you heard wind. Um, but that particular piece, it's hard to, it's hard to talk about the various uh, things that one is hearing because a lot of them are sort of illusory because of all these pre-recorded tapes that were then being played back in the environment. So it's like a compression of the space in both, both spatially and temporally into one single location, a condensation effect. But the very synchronicities that occurred that were very, very strange, so, which I have no, absolutely no explanation for except maybe synchronicity. Uh, those things were, um, for instance, which you did not hear in this, some sections of the other part of the pre-recorded tape, one of the people who was on one of the mountain uh, tops was describing his environment. He was recording some very specific events, like the sequence of a particular crow flying out of the tree and sweeping through the center of the space where he was sitting. And at the moment that that was played back during the performance, and remember that recording was made a month earlier, at the moment at which that was played back into the space, that's what happened in real time. In exact correspondence to his description of it. And that occurred repeatedly. It was very, very eerie. Now that may simply be the nature of the, the the complexity of nature as we know it, that those sorts of things overlap and the behaviors of animals may be such that they do repeat in a consistent fashion like that. Um, there's some very interesting work by, um, it was recently written up in Cold Earth, Cold Earth Review, but Bernard Krauss, who's a, a uh, bioacoustician who has been working on a theory about um, what he calls biospectra. He's made various recordings in um, different locations, extensive samples, like in Africa or the United States, wherever, where over periods of time, each day taking a sample at exactly the same time of day and doing that for a very extended period of time. And what he found is that the, the identic, it's the sonogram readout of that, and you see it visually, you can hear it, it sounds always the same, but he wasn't quite sure, so he wanted to see a sonog sonograph readout of that. And what's really astounding is that it's absolutely consistent. And he's proposing a, a, a new theory that that kind of um, structuring that's inherent to the environment could be used as something that's symptomatic. We, could, we knew enough about the nature of the sounds. For instance, if they found a particular bird that would, would be singing and then suddenly stop, it would be filled in, the texture would be filled in by some other member of the same species. And so it's this tapestry that never changes. It's, you know, on, the, on the most minute local level, it's continually changing. All these different life forms are participating in that in great numbers. But if you look at it at a global, large macro effect of that within an environment, in a bioregion, what you find is an absolutely consistent pattern and fabric which remains consistent, stable. Yeah. Right, exactly. If something changes, that if this, is, if this behavior of the environment has been consistent over a long period of time and then suddenly radically changes, that must evidently be symptomatic of something that's either wrong or, or some sort of radical reorganization that's occurring within the ecosystem. Right.
Sure. <laughs> um, it's a very good question. The answer I would give, which uh, may not be as good as the question, is has more to do with my own difficulty with the assumptions of traditional science. The whole notion of repeatability, for instance, that most of Western science disregards the function of time, that the whole notion of return to initial conditions presupposes that, um, for instance, if you do an experiment and then you try to repeat get certain results and you try to repeat that experiment, the whole assumption is that if it is repeatable through some sort of uh, specification for the structure of the experiment, you can even repeat it somewhere else or you can repeat it uh, uh, at a different time in the same location or whatever. It disregards time as a factor in that that if you were to really repeat the experiment, you'd have to do the same experiment exactly the same way at exactly the same time and place, which is, of course, if you've done it, then you can't repeat it. So part of my problem with that is I don't really think things are repeatable in that fashion. Granted, there are limits to that because all science ever has tried to do, the, the, the sort of general uh, misunderstanding of science is that science tries to prove things. It tries that it tries to uh, to determine the truth of things. And science has never really made those claims. A lot of scientists would, and I think they you know, don't understand the, the nature of science. Science simply tries to make a, a fairly unpredictable world a little bit more predictable. And it does that through manipulating nature itself. So to understand the nature of the experiment, one has to, to realize that science is a filter. It's like what Sir Arthur Eddington said. Science is not about the physical world. What science is about is the filters that we use to try to describe that physical phenomena that we call physical reality. It has more to do with that. It really is about the structure of the assumptions we make about how the world operates. Exactly. Sure, sure. That, that, could very, that could very well be. I, I think that's, uh, I think the purpose that this kind of activity does is not so much, it's, it's sort of that relationship as the, like the neuro, uh, Chilean neurophysiologist Francisco Varela talks about the distinction between um, metaphor and mechanism, that good science needs both, and that the relationship of art to that is that art provides a larger metaphoric frame, and that Often, that's what Ezra Pound said, that artists, he was saying poets, but I think it applies to artists in general, that they're antennae to the future. That by not trying to be so rigorous in terms of uh, the nature of those filters that we call science, by playing with that in a different kind of way, which is also much more metaphoric, it perhaps will allow for the opening of possibility that could, just what you're saying, you know, be turned into something that has more scientific rigor to it. I would like that. I think that would be quite wonderful. Not, not directly. Not directly. It's something that interests me a lot. I, I, one of the things I'd like to do into the future is to take this some, same notion of Krauss's uh, uh, theory about this biospectrum notion and uh, do something using the environment as a way, not so much just using like the visual phenomena or this audible thing of, of recordings and sonographs, but to do experiments where you set up, which is this notion of the sound sculpture, for instance, 
set up these systems of they're under perturbation consistently so you do have something like a nonlinear oscillator which is under perturbation from the environment consistently and allow that to be the basis for a data stream which is being analyzed but also perhaps fed back into the environment. Okay, well, I'm informed that uh, there's a reception afterwards, so maybe we should stop here. Thank you all. Uh, I could play one, I'll just play a little bit of this. This is, uh, this is uh, about another eight minutes or something. This is a study for this sculpture called Sonic Mirror. What you're going to hear is actual sounds that are being generated electronically and by computer that are under control. They're directly being controlled by the sounds of the environment. I need the lights down again. Thank you. This is very noisy, so uh, and probably unpleasant. So. <laughs>
and I think we'll have a reception now. Thank you.